Good morning and welcome to our worship at East Brandywine Baptist Church. Happy Father's Day to all you dads. I'm so grateful that you have made the time to join us and worship this morning. Reminds me of what Billy Graham said about fathers. He said, a good father is one of the most unsung, unpraised, unnoticed, and yet one of the most valuable assets of our society. To that end, I'd like to recommend to you this devotion called Gospel Meditations for Fathers. It's, one of, uh, it's a monthly devotional that will encourage you to continue to be the most valuable asset in our society today by sharing relevant scripture and asking relevant questions and making um, application as well. You can order these or a copy of these um, and get, or maybe two copies and give one away um, and at www.churchworksmedia.com. I'm confident this will be a blessing to you. I want to be sure that we welcome our guests this morning we've, we, that we have joining us for the first time. Uh, please be sure to visit our website if you're not already there at ebbcpa.org. Click on the live stream button, and then in the upper right-hand corner, if you click on new here, it'll allow you to be able to fill out our electronic connection card. We love to be able to know who you are and, and how we can uh, be a better, ser better service to you. So if you fill out that card, that would be a great blessing to us. If you have your Bible this morning, we're going to do our call to worship. Um, out of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. So I appreciate it. If you grab your Bible, open that up, and I'm going to read to us our call to worship. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 1. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, and one spirit, just as we were called to the hope, to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. You comfort those in need. You lift us up from weeks like eagles. Let us come before our God in prayer. Let us pray. 
holy and triune God, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We come to praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. We sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches into the heavens and your truth into the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all of the earth. We praise you as our heavenly Father, in whose presence we find love, courage, and acceptance. This past week you have watched over and guided us, kept us safe, and only allowed into our lives what is good for our growing into the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, you have blessed us with friends, family, our faith. You've given us food, shelter, work to do. While you have loved us more than we can imagine, God, we have at times been selfish, prideful, insisting on our own way. We have been arrogant and boastful, impatient and uncaring. Hear us as we confess to you silently. Father, we thank you that in Christ our sins are forgiven. As far as the east is from the west, so far have you removed these sins from us. This has cost your son's death on the cross, taking the punishment we deserved. Let these mercies draw us to yourself. You, who have brought us like Joseph from a dark, gloomy prison cell into the realm of the king. Father, since we have been raised with Christ, may we seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at your right hand. May we set our minds on things above, not on things on earth. For we have died, and our life is hidden with Christ in you. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then we also will appear with him in glory. We thank you for these truths in your word. God, for sons and daughters, May you help us to honor our fathers this day. God, we pray for fathers. We ask for wisdom and humility in the face of the task of parenting. Give us strength to do well by our children and by you. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters at Windsor Baptist Church and for Providence Church in Coatesville. May you keep them grounded in your word and built upon the sure foundation of your son. God, in our congregation, we pray for healing for Dolly DePiro. Pray for strength for Angelo. For Jill Chappelle, that doctors will determine the cause of her pain and offer wise treatment. For strength and healing for Cora Dart, for Kevin White, and for Glenn Diffenbach. God, we pray for comfort too for Greg Beal and his family at the passing of his mom. We pray for wisdom for our church leadership and we plan on reuniting soon. We ask for safety and for unity. May our love abound more and more for each other. God, we pray for the offering that will be received this week. May it come from joyful hearts as an act of worship to you. We pray for Pastor Joe as he shares your word with us. May you mold our hearts that it might land on fertile ground and yield a good harvest among us. That the words of his mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And may we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. We're about to watch another episode of Pilgrim's Progress when last we saw Christian and Hopeful, they had escaped the giant of despair. They had gotten back on the road and they met up with a shepherd. So let's see what happens this week as Christian and Hopeful are walking on the path. Correct. 
Well, if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Psalm 133. That's where we're going to be today. I'm going to read that for us. Psalm 133. It's a short psalm in the Psalms of Ascents. And um, Psalm 133, starting in verse 1. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. I was studying uh, for my sermon the other day and thinking about how I was going to open up with an illustration to help get us a, a better picture in our heads around um, what this what this psalm is speaking about, which is obviously unity, brothers dwelling together in unity. And I got an email from my daughter's school. Uh, it was a needed distraction for me at the time. Um, so I opened it up. And uh, Now, I had heard my daughter um, working on her part for a virtual choir project, uh, project and honestly, uh, it sounded kind of funny to me without all the other parts. But I had forgotten all about that and, until I opened up this email with the video of, of the finished project. I want to play this for you because I think it will help us to see more clearly what David means by unity. We're going to watch this now.
The word unity in verse 1 can also be translated harmony, Consist, a consistent, orderly, or pleasing arrangement of parts. Having only heard one part myself, it sounded a little disjointed until I heard it brought together by a conductor to be one arrangement, one voice um, that was orderly, good, unified, and pleasant. The unity demonstrated here by this high school choir is just like the unity, the harmony, the concord that is the blessed privilege of the people of God, orchestrated by one conductor to be one voice in worship to one God. I want to just walk through this psalm with us um, and just kind of try to explain it and apply some things as we go along. And the first thing that I want to point out in verse 1 is the, David's praise of unity. David's praise of unity. This psalm begins with the word behold. David wants to call attention to something special. He wants us to see how beneficial, how good, and how pleasant it is for people to dwell together in harmony. Any parent who's gone on a family trip for any longer than 10 minutes doesn't need to be convinced that unity between brothers and sisters is a good and a pleasant thing. But they're often pleasantly surprised when it takes place. And oh, how they encourage their children to harmony prior to that trip. No one knows for sure the date of this psalm or the occasion that David might have written it. But it's no stretch to imagine David standing in Hebron, ready to be crowned king after eight years of civil unrest and war from a divided kingdom as all the tribes of Israel, laying aside their mutual animosities, came to David at Hebron, or they come to David at Hebron, and they spoke to him and they said, Behold, we are the bone of thy flesh. 2 Samuel 5.1 And hear him say, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. Good for it brings, brings glory to God, and pleasant or sweet, that it's beneficial to all who partake in it. Or consider those Israelites who were making their journey to Jerusalem as they sang this psalm looking around at all their brethren from many different tribes, coming from many different places, all coming together to worship God as one. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. So what makes this unity good, so good and pleasant? What's unity like? Well, David tells us what it's like in these next two verses, verses 2 and the beginning of verse 3. He says, it's like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. This is a picture of unity. We have the praise of unity, but now we have the picture of unity. Unity is... Is, a treasure, it is as treasured as the anointing oil from the consecration of Aaron. If you look at verse 2, you see that word precious? That could be translated as treasured. This is something that is to be treasured. Unity like the oil flows from the head that is Jesus Christ. Chapter 17 in the high priestly prayer of Jesus, Jesus prayed in, in verses 22 through 23, he said this, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Jesus says the oneness that we experience with him should lead to the oneness we experience with one another. He's given us his glory so that we may be one, verse 22. The glory that Jesus gave the disciples is the glory of oneness with the Father and the Son through the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within his, the disciples, they have oneness with the Father and the Son as well as oneness with one another. In other words, their unity is from God through the Holy Spirit. This is a remarkable thought. I started to think and I started to say, does this imp uh, imply that unity is not so much a byproduct of a discussion or diplomacy as it is worship, repentance, and prayer? Now, I'm not saying that discussion and there's no room for discussion and diplomacy. 
I think we ought to have that. I think that's part of unity. But the bigger part of unity is that, that indwelling of the Spirit, that idea that we allow us to dwell in us through His Spirit and we worship Him. And there's repentance and there's growth and there's prayer. And the more that we, we allow Jesus to abide in us and we in Him, the more that we experience that oneness with Him, the more that we can have that oneness, that unity, that harmony with one another. Does it also mean to the degree to which we seek together, uh, seek God together, will assist us to find common ground in our lives together? Well, not only did that oil flow on the head of Aaron, but just as that anointing oil continued to flow from that head to the beard of Aaron, to the collar of Aaron's robes, consecrating the whole man and blessing the entire nation because the anointing was God's yes to the institution of the priesthood and the tabernacle. And it meant the blessing of God dwelling among them. So it is with our unity, our sweet harmony as God's people. In, in back in, in John chapter 17 and verse 23, um, Jesus says, uh, exact, before verse 23, he says, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. And here's why. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. You see that in verse 23? This oneness we have in Christ as we live it out together not only benefits us, but it runs down into the lives of those outside the body of Christ so that the world may know that God sent Jesus and loves us just as he loved Jesus. Jesus prayed that the visible unity of the church would convince many in the world concerning his divine mission of redemption. The church's unity is the foundation of its evangelism. It demonstrates that Christ is the Savior who transfer, transforms lives John 13, 35 says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. This is why we should be grieved when there are carnal divisions, strife, backbiting, and quarreling in the church. It drives unbelievers away. Who wants to be part of that? The effectiveness of the church's evangelism is devastated by dissensions and disputes among its members. This is why Paul urges us to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace in Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But we have this picture of unity. And the first picture that David gives to us in verse 2 is this, this treasured ointment that's running down the head and the beard and the vestments of Aaron and flowing out to the people and blessing the people. But then he gives us this, this um, second picture of unity in chapter in verse 3 in the beginning of verse 3 and, it, and he says it's like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion unity is, a ref, is as refreshing as dew on Mount Zion Mount Hermon and Zion dew was an important source of moisture for people in the ancient Near East replacing some of the moisture lost during those hot days in that region it was important for the growth and a successful harvest. And it was used figuratively in the Old Testament as a symbol of blessing. For example, Isaac blessed Jacob by asking that the dew of heaven be given him in Genesis 27, 28. Dew is also a symbol of refreshment, renewal, and prosperity. Hosea, uh, God says um, through the prophet Hosea in chapter 14, verse 5, I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall take root like the trees of Lebanon. I love what Calvin says about this verse. He says, David suggests that the life of man would be sapless, unprofitable, and wretched unless Satan by brother, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, unless sustained by brotherly harmony, our unity is like the dew on mountains surrounding Zion that brings life. Living and worshiping together in harmony for us promotes spiritual life as we pray for one another, encourage one another, exhort one another, love one another, comfort one another, being in full accord and of one mind. And then finally we see here 
in uh, the second part of verse 3, the blessing of unity. The blessing commanded by God, by the Lord of unity. God commands or he appoints his blessing where unity is cultivated. God is pleased when there's unity amongst his people and promises to bless them. The Apostle Paul helps to see, us to see this in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. And again in Philippians 4, 9, he says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. What greater blessing can we have than to know that the very God, the God of peace, who created all things and sustains all things, is with us? Is this not the very essence of everlasting life? So, what does this look like practically in the church as we've gone through this and we see that, you know, David is commending um, and praise, commending uh, unity to us and to the people of Israel, and he's praising unity, how good and how pleasant it is, and then he gives us these examples of, of this precious ointment uh, or oil that is flowing down, Aaron is blessing him and, and, set, and um, setting him apart and blessing the people. And then this dew that is supplying uh, water for the crops is, um, is blessing the people. And that is what unity is like as um, God blesses them. And then this, this everlasting, this life forevermore is blessings from God. How is this worked out practically? What does this mean to us? Well, first of all, I want us to understand that our unity is in Christ. Galatians 3, 27 through 29 says this, For as many of you as we're baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one. There it is, in Christ Jesus. And then again in Ephesians 2, 18 and 19, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father, speaking to the Gentiles, that God has made the Jew and the Gentile one. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Christ is our head. He gives us this blessed privilege of unity as he abides in us through his Holy Spirit. Some of you may be listening this morning, not ever having, have experienced <clears throat> the blessings of unity with God and his people Dear ones, this is only, and you can only have this through faith alone in Jesus Christ. Believing that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sins. A penalty so great you could never pay for it yourself. Jesus took that penalty of your sins when he died on the cross. Then he triumphantly rose from the dead, purchasing a righteousness for all those who would believe. A righteousness not found in us, but placed to our account. So God no longer sees our sins, but Christ's righteousness. Will you believe? Will you trust Christ died for you, that you might share in the blessed privilege of unity with God and his people? So Christ has secured this unity for us. It's in him that we're unified. And even though uh, though we are one in Christ, though, There's still diversity. That's the wonderful thing about the unity of the body of Christ is that we are one, but we're all different. Paul says in in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we're a body made up of all kinds of members with all kinds of jobs, but we work together as one body. And in Ephesians 4.11, Paul describes, he says this, he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers Biblical unity does not mean uniformity in everything. The church body, which is one, has diversity. That's a wonderful thing. We do not all have the same gifts or talents. We are a church made up of of and called from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Thus, we don't have uniformity in all of these aspects. These differences strengthen the church. 
and help build it up. However, diversity doesn't do away with unity of belief, of our core beliefs. Diversity of gifts, talents, race, culture, language, nationality, learning, gender, status, does not mean diversity of our core beliefs. What we believe about God and Jesus and our faith, these core beliefs that make up um, who we are as Christians. The Apostle Paul makes this evident as he describes this unity of the Spirit and these core beliefs. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. That never changes. There's not diversity in that. That will always be, we will always be um, unified around that body of belief, that core belief. If Jesus wanted everyone to be the same, would he have picked a religious zealot that fought against Romans, uh, a tax collector who worked for the Romans, fishermen who paid taxes to the Romans? No. All of the disciples, all of the apostles came from all kinds of different walks of life. So diverse, but yet one in Christ and one around the core beliefs of their faith. So we are one in Christ, yet we are diverse as a body and we function as one. So because there is diversity in our oneness, our unity, our harmony, how then do we go about maintaining the unity that is our blessed privilege as God's people? Well, again, I want to take us back to Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. And Paul says there, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, four ways that we maintain this unity that, that we don't produce. It's a unity that comes by God through the Spirit, right? And it's in and around Christ and this core beliefs that we believe about our faith. There's four ways that we keep that. Humility, gentleness, patience, and love. The first way is humility. It means to see yourself as God sees you with infinite and inherent value, but with no more value than anyone else. It means being willing to accept God as the authority over your life rather than insisting on being your supreme authority. It means you're willing to order your life in such a way as to serve God by serving others. When all, when, when all Christians do that, everyone's needs are met by others in a context of harmony and love. That's what we're striving for. We're not there yet, but that's what we're striving for. We want to be there. And I dare say this includes forgiveness because later on in chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says this, forgiving one another as God, even for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So brother, sister, we don't wait to go to our brothers and sisters who we may have offended or offended us, but we go to them with a spirit of humility and we speak to them, and we seek forgiveness, and we seek reconciliation. We don't wait for the other. And we do that with humility. But then secondly, we do that with gentleness. We maintain this, this spirit of unity, um, yeah, this maintaining the unity that is, is ours through the spirit, or of the spirit, through humility and also through gentleness. Gentleness means power under control. I may be right and have all the evidence on my side, but that doesn't mean that I have to use it to destroy my brother or sister in Christ. Proverbs 18.14 says, A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? We ought to be as gentle, the Bible says, as a nursing mother. How gentle is a mother who's nursing her child with that, with that Small child holding it close and caring for that child. That's the picture that Paul gives to us when he speaks about being gentle to one another. This, that's specifically for pastors, but I believe that's for everyone. That we ought to have that kind of gentleness. We ought to be, as James says, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Gentle with others as we deal with them. 
And then thirdly, in that passage in Ephesians 4, we're to be patient. We're to practice patience. Patience, brothers and sisters, is believing God's timetable is good no matter what it is. Patience is waiting for God to act when, where, and how God chooses. Patience with others is allowing the Holy Spirit to do His work in others' lives and not demand that they change how we think they should. That's patience. We need to pray that God would give us that. By the way, these are all fruits of the Spirit. These are not things that we can do in our own strength. And as you know, you're probably reading that in Ephesians 4. The final, um, the final thing that we can do to maintain this spirit, um, excuse me, this unity in the spirit in the bond of peace is love. Bearing with one another in love. And this is a willingness to put up with something or someone in a spirit of love. This unity that we have in Christ Jesus is not a call to hit eject on relationships when they become messy like when we have a strong disagreement on a particular subject with a brother or sister in Christ. Instead, the unity that I have, I have in Christ with my brother compels me to love him or her through the messiness and disagreement for my brother's sake, for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, for the glory of God. Do not be deceived, folks. Satan will stop at nothing to destroy friendships and marriages, families and churches, sowing the seeds of division, discord, and dissension. We must eagerly maintain the blessed privilege of unity we have together in Christ Jesus. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell in unity. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you, Lord, give us this unity. This is not something that we can produce in our own spirit. This isn't something that we can manufacture or make up. It doesn't come from the world. In fact, Lord, the world desires the kind of unity that we have as a blessed privilege by the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus. And we praise and we thank you for that, Lord. I pray that that would be a treasure to us. I pray that our unity that we have in Christ around the core doctrines of our faith as we, as we uh, keep those, Lord, that unity that we have, that it would be a treasure. We would treasure it like a, like a precious gem, like a jewel that we would pressure, a, a family heirloom, Lord. We would care for it. And Lord, that we would pay attention to it, that we would maintain it eagerly, Lord, through love and through patience and through gentleness and through humility loving one another that the world that's looking for this kind of unity would see the unity that we have together and would demonstrate to them Jesus Christ that you sent your son Jesus and that you love him and that you love us and that they would want that Lord and that we would have opportunity to share with them the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the unity that we have. May we maintain it for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name.
of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Happy Father's Day. God bless you.